So, have you ever been possessed by anything? <laughs> I, I think I just was. You know. Um, and now, how, how do we start this? It's awkward. But, um, I, I, I wanted to ask you to talk, this is the obvious question, to talk a little bit about the internet stories in Josh's new book are, you know, deal with virtual reality and its consequences in, in all kinds of original ways, but the, uh, and they're very different, these stories, but the, the one that, that I was most moved by is, is the last one, which means the longest in the book, and it's called Sin, and it, it begins with a folk tale. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's almost as if the story begins at the beginning of literature in a way. And, and as the narrative evolves, we sort of barrel towards the present. And, uh, and things take a very dark turn. And you get characters on either side of the screen. Uh, and, and finally, it, it's almost as if the, the male character penetrates to use you know, a, a sort of charged word you know, into that world on the other side uh, with, with bizarre kinds of consequences. And I, I'm, I, I, I guess I don't have a specific question, <laughs> but, but it, that story seems to say something, as the others do as well. But, but this one, well, may, maybe we can. I can talk about it in a way that also has to, I, I think, uh, uh, have to do with your writing. I mean, I've, I've been reading you for, no, but, but it should, because the more, more interesting thing than, than, than you know, I've, I've been going around for, for a couple of weeks doing a, a little tour for this book, and I, you know, I, I, shouldn't, um, I shouldn't complain that people are asking me questions, but it, I, I've been answering questions about the internet and internet pornography sure. for about two weeks, and I can't shower enough, I can't tell you. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but I will say that that in that story, which is actually something that, that I, I would very much like to talk about, and I think it, it has to do a lot with with, with your approaches to things. Uh, uh, certain stories in this book, and then and then um, a novella of yours, uh, North of God, right? Where you, there's this idea that you want to have access to this um, to this old way of telling something. And you want to have access to the authority of something that's old, and you want to have um, you want to you know as bad a word as penetrate is appropriate, or maybe not as bad. But you want to you want to appropriate some of that authority to yourself, and um, and it's very difficult to do that and not um, end up uh, writing kitsch. It's very difficult to do that and not end up um, uh, uh, being compared to your models. Uh, um, negatively, and I think that one of the one of the things that 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 I think that's a problem for all Jewish fiction in general, you know, in a non-Jewish language, let's say. Um, but I think one of the things that that saves uh, uh, your work from that and saves uh, I, I hope I work towards saving this piece from it is to realize what is the nature of the Desire, you know, um, you, you don't want to borrow that authenticity to um, to foist it upon people as a normative authenticity for now. Like this is how Jews live. There's always this sadness in it. There's this idea that you know, in this one, a tumbler, like you know, comedian, kind of comes back and and inhabits. And uh, uh, and and in the story that you're describing, um, in the book, a guy sort of he finds himself in a he goes to Eastern Europe to pursue this woman. He sees an internet porn, and he ends up um, in a in a village uh, inhabited by sort of these floating ghosts of all the women he's ever uh, masturbated to. Um, and, and he's led there through a, a, a discussion with the wolf, and a discussion with the bear, and these sort of fairy tale, you know, characters. Um, and uh, but but I think the important thing is to recognize the desire why why you want to borrow these modes. And it, it, it's, it, it, and it seems to me, and this is a question I'll ask you, we're probably getting too dark right away, but why, if you agree with that, and I don't know if you do, but if you agree with it, why does it seem that that desire always um, 
points out the sadness of loss of what you you know the modes that you've lost. Yeah, and I again thinking about your story as you're talking about mine because there there is that moment in the story when you're you're describing that these these girls who have you know, filmed themselves having sex in these internet uh, porn videos and that they cease to belong to themselves mm -hmm. and that in, in, in a sense their you know, their souls are lost and by the time your character finds this village of you know it's like a village of girls with lost souls that disembody uh, and it's it's chilling and and I I recognize that impulse in my own stuff I you know I, I often make a very little distinction you know, between body and soul and even to the point of well, there's a character in, in, in one of the stories in the new book who he goes bungee jumping and uh, this is a long way around from the, the original but uh, the, the cord breaks and he's falling you know to what he thinks and the soul within him thinks is his death. The soul being a cowardly, nebbish sort of entity flees, you know, rather than face, you know, this, this disastrous consequence. And um, and it, it turns out that he lands in a big mattress <laughs> and he has to, you know, spend the rest of his, his days soulless. But, but in a way, I, I think that you are finding an original way to tell a very old tale, you know, and where the the internet serves as this, this sort of intermediate device, you know, that, that deprives the character of, you know, of spirit and, and even even phys physicality to to an extent that you know that that I can find the folk tale. Mm -hmm. You know, I can find the, the sort of primal, traditional story, which is which is what intrigued me about your story so much because you chose to begin it that way. So, in a way, I felt like you were you were describing the arc, of, you know, of, of you know, the fifty-five point of literature, you know, from from its beginnings into you know. The, well, I mean, I was just all I was doing was you know creating. You know a bad history of literature, but I I, I want to ask like a, a a pointed soul question, which is that this this book you, know, you put it back in your bag. Or that's very you know that's a good detail. You know, right a reason he puts his book back in his bag. I mean, always leave it at your bag. But put the light under the book. Yeah, but but uh, um, it's I mean these are decades of, of stories collected in, in one volume. And it uh, and it is uh, arranged um, thematically, probably the, the, the largest um, section being the pinch and and and, um, and a world that you essentially invented out of scraps and imagination. Um, a a a southern abyssal reality. Abyssal reality. <laughs> sure, sure. It's more, more impressive when it's you know another job. But but uh, and um, and it. It seems when you, when I was looking, because I have the collections, sort of you know scattered on shelves, and but all together like that, it, it feels uh, for a moment like, um, well, like two things. I mean, when this book came in the mail, I felt like I got when I first got a copy of the you know the Faulkner Reader, because I had read you know all the Yavna Padua stuff kind of you know here and there, but then you know I open it up and there's like a map, and then there's like that long introduction. You know, there's that, that long tally introduction that just kind of tells you uh, everything. It determines, you know, a reading of Faulkner for, for forever, but it gives you a world, and it and it and it, it points out the discrepancies in the world, and and, and it, but it also points out the emotional truth in the world. And uh, so it reminded me of that, but it also reminded me I had a, a, a small book that I think the Jewish Publication Society put out in the uh, in the very early 50s called Inside Kasralevka, which is a, a collection of all of of, of Shalvalakim's Kasralevka stories. And also a, a small little thing that was also next to it, which is the Yehudet stories, you know, and, and, and sort of not all of them, but but, but a few uh, uh, stories about another town, another shtetl that he that he uh, wrote about, 
And, um, and so I guess my, my question for you, as long as we're talking about soul, is how does it feel having it all there? And what was the intentionality, what was the intention when you, when you first decided that you were going to dig into you know, Memphis and dig into, and, well, and, and dig into a, you know, a, a, a Jewish community that not many people sort of knew about? Oh, God, this is, I kind of think of a short answer to that. I mean, my intention for gathering you know, these stories in a, in a companion volume like that is that most of them have been residing in university press warehouses for, you know, for decades. Uh, but I, I, I suppose the thing that was kind of sobering when I got the book was just to discover how consistent the themes you know, have been, and maybe the theme, you know, because all my characters seem to be sort of caught between a couple of worlds, attempting to commute and failing. But uh, I, you know, yeah, the Yakna Batapa, <laughs> you know, idea is, is something that growing up, yeah. cop, our father lived down the road from me yeah. when I was a kid. And uh, you ever meet him? I, I never met him. I met his brother. <laughs> we, we used to drive down there in my adolescence and drink beer uh, on the, the lawn and growing up. And, uh, and here we go into anecdotes, which is <laughs> I come meeting. But the brother came out to show us the way. And when we said that we're you know, devotees, and, uh, and he treated us well. Actually, and we talked with uh, anyway, yeah. Yakin Batapa, Babel's Odessa, Joyce's Dublin, Dickens' London, you know, I mean, to, 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 to own a place was something that had been an impulse of mine for a long time. I mean, I, I grew up in Memphis without any knowledge of the pinch, you know, it's this Jewish ghetto, which was really long gone. How many square blocks are we talking about at its height? Oh, you know, it, it, it's maybe, it, not more than a mile in length, you know, with Jews living on either side of it, you know, over the shops and, and some of the houses along the side streets. But uh, I, you're, you know, it's a leading question because I can talk about it forever. And we'll do. I, I, and, and, you know, and all of my friends are tired of hearing about it. But uh, it's, it's just that I had no real relation to with heritage at all, you know, growing up in, in Memphis uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, I like to joke that my synagogue was a Lutheran synagogue, and, you know, it was expunged of almost every element of, of tradition, uh, and so I managed to escape, you know, I was confirmed rather than bar mitzvah, and, uh, you know, fled the city, uh, spent years, you know, Counterculture, living on hippie common and one time, and washed back up in Memphis and got a job out of desperation in a folklore center and was assigned his task of uh, you know, interviewing the Jewish survivors of this neighborhood, uh, the Pinch, and suddenly, which had faded by what year? Oh, after World War II, it was already in decline, and by the time I was growing up, it was a blighted neighborhood. Parking lots, vacant lots, crumbling buildings. Uh, there's once been five synagogues. There, the only one remaining was the Anche Mishnah, which had been converted into a, a transvestite discotheque, the Rainbow Club. The so called Anche Mishnah? It's, well, yeah. no, it was the Rainbow Club. <laughs> uh, but for me, you know, harvesting the memories of these people, hearing the stories of growing up there, uh, reassembled the place in, in my mind and also I, I could not divorce the place from the culture, the history, the literature that was attached to it. That, you know, these people, most of them were immigrants, that they brought with them. So it was, you know, you know I, I, grandiose metaphors come to mind, you know, but, but it didn't feel like sort of raising, you know, a lost continent from the bottom of the sea or something. So I, you know, wrote a book of stories that were set there. Uh, and uh, the, you know, I like to say that the, the, the old 
people were so grateful for my mythologization of the neighborhood that they sued me for a quarter of a million yeah. dollars now. Uh, you know, for a libel. Uh, but but the, 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 the thing is, and I'll shut up about this, and it's, it's probably, you know, it's been the sort of ruling passion of my adult life and, and the reason why, you know, you and, and my mother were dead, or my readers, you know, is that what, you know, I, I discovered thinking that the, the heritage that, you know, I was born into was dry as dust mm -hmm. uh, and pretty antiseptic was that the literature, the lore, the culture uh, had attached to it this sort of comet's tale of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine that, you know. It was like a secret that the rabbis had been keeping in the attic, you know. So you go up, you know, in my, my old synagogue above the, you know, the loft, above the pipe organs, and. And lo and behold, you know, cowering there, you find the Dibbuk, you know, you find the Golem, the Jewish Frankenstein, the, the Gilgul, you know, the wandering soul. It's like the rabbis have been keeping this a secret, you know, all these years. So I, you know, uh, I'm an old hippie, and uh, I, I, I believe in magic while reserving the right to feel like an absolute ass, you know, for believing in it. So, you know, I, I take the piss out of myself for that kind of credibility. But, but uh, I, uh, I fell in love with the war, and it's been like, you know, the mother load when I discovered the Kabbalah, for God's sake. And, you know, began mining it and thinking, you know, exhaust this vein, Sure, and then get back to writing about, you know, people standing in the kitchen talking about broken relationships. You know? And uh, I, I can't leave it. I've got friends who still say, Stern, when are you going to drop the Jewish masquerade? <laughs> and, uh, I can't get it. Uh, so yeah, it's enough of that. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, with the exception of you know, with the exception of, 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 of Bob Oldo, you know, he, he traveled a decent amount. Um, there's been really no great um, you know, Jewish literature, Yiddish literature is mostly, you know, writers writing, you know, on the run, you know, or, you know, some sort of transients. Um, there's not, to my mind, like a great, uh, uh, Essentially, association of a writer with uh, a city as much as there is a writer with an imaginary city, or a city that they're sort of writing back to and sending, you know, and sending sort of messages back to. And um, and I, I guess the the question I, I had about this is so when you you're not going to let me turn this around. No, <laughs> no, not at all. No, or, I, I just know because I mean I'm interested and I want to know essentially was this a um, when you decided to write about Pinch, when you decided to write about these lives, um, what made you cut yourself out, you know, and kind of focus on, because you know, when you're reading it, I mean, I asked, you know, end of World War II, you know, you're telling me it fades, because these stories really seem to be anywhere from, you know, a kind of late 19th century to, you know, an early 20th century when they're, when they're radios, you know? But, uh, but there doesn't really, it seems completely timeless. And I guess my, 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 my question to you is what, what were your models for that, for that timelessness and why, um, and what was the historical interest in it as opposed to recording your reaction, unlike the story you read just now, which, and I'm not going to substitute you know, character for author, but you know, the Catskill story, Wedding Jester, has, has um, it has a, not only is it contemporary, you know, it's contemporary, but it, it, it has um, the presence and the judgment of the contemporary. These are terrific questions. I, <laughs> um, and I, I, the simple answer is that the, the experience was not my experience. And, and uh, I, I had never any real primary experience of the Jewish community. Um, and, you know, I know a few Jews. And, you know, some of them are my best friends. <laughs> But, uh, but it, it, of course, it, it gets more complicated than that. And 
Yeah. No, I'm, no, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I probably asked that question a little too close for an audience to kind of, you know, as Steve's uh, uh, see, your last novel, The Frozen Rabbi, is, the, is, is, is um, what, what is the television show that he ends up watching when he gets thought out? Oh, Rabbi, he watches like America's Got Talent. I or think he watches. <laughs> maybe it was from Jerry Springer. Or Jerry. Jerry. But so it, 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 it's 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 all of this concern with 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 the Jewish occult and with and with both ways like that. But but the shock is that it, this Rabbi is you know arrives today, you know, and is thought out today in this sort of you know well, found caveman scenario. You mentioned the timelessness and again. You know, I, I, much variety in your book, <laughs> you know, being reflexive here, but but the you know the, the again I, I keep coming back to that last story because you, you do begin with the kind of you know the timelessness of the tale, mm -hmm. and when you talk about authority, when you talk about authenticity, authenticity is a, is a, is a a charged word for me because I do come from outside the tradition, and I always feel like I'm poaching a bit. And that there, you know, there's a way in which the stories, because most of my knowledge of, of that world is book learned, you know, there's an element of artificiality. And I, I again, you know, I, I felt like you were beginning from a timeless place and you know, taking us from myth into history. And I, I believe that in fiction, you can have it both ways. And you can have the story that is grounded in it, you know, grounded in a kind of a primal tale you know, that, that resonates the way the biblical story will resonate, and also bootleg it into the historical moment, as you have done in you know, with, with this you know, very contemporary world of the internet and the way that the internet separates a human being from his or her own identity. Uh, and, and it says something about the, the power of telling a story, you know, that, that that separation from identity is, you know, it has such pathos. Mm -hmm in the context of the story, which is all about the impossibility of retaining an identity in that world. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to come back to your original question, because I didn't, didn't really address it very well. And in, in my, am I saying something that resonates with what you were doing there? And, and you know, I, I think so. I mean, I was trying, you know, I was trying with that story to, uh, You know, the internet is is something that uh, the history of literature, right? Is you open a book and you sort of vicariously experience someone else's life, right? You 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 follow, you know, their ups and downs, their arcs, their triangles, whatever sort of you know shape you want to make. That's what they you know, that's what you follow. And uh, so the, the vicariousness of fiction is um, is pretty much the vicariousness of the internet, though I think less immersive and less rewarding. You know, to a degree less intelligent. So when I had this idea that uh, I was going to write about the internet, I was essentially going to give people the vicarious. I was going to made the decision I was going to write about people on the internet, and I didn't want to just have them sitting in a room typing. You know, I didn't want to write some some like you know, Toussaint novel or some sort of like nouveau roman where someone's just sitting in a room and. They type and a bug slowly crawls across the <laughs> wall. Um, then I had to accept the fact that um, I was giving someone a, a, a vicarious experience of someone else having a vicarious experience. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the metafiction was built in. I was writing a story about someone who online was writing their own story, mm -hmm. and uh, which then, you know, um, of course, the great pleasure in that is then to find out which of those levels of you know, separation. Yeah, well, well, like which, what to privilege when and why to privilege it. And that really can seem, on one hand, a very technical question, like is this story getting out of hand and we've, we just ended up, um, you know, in a realm that has, uh, have we been disconcerted in a, in a, in a bad way? Yeah. 
But, but really that question I think actually is, is a much more fundamental question, which is, or for me it was, which is um, what should be privileged um, in, in life, like reality or fantasy? Mm -hmm. And when do you retreat to fantasy and when do you treat, retreat into, into reality? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what you, you use those two modes as, you know, uh, ultimately like emetics and let's say like antidotes for, you know, different things. And so I made sure that uh, in that story, that uh, uh, that things happened on certain planes, um, that when they happened in the real or in something that was you know presented as the real, that they were there to make the character feel grounded, mm -hmm. and when they happened in fantasy, it was to make him feel threatened or you know temporarily elated, let's say. But um, but throughout, I needed something to sort of tie it together, and I guess throughout it was this notion that. Um, the language kind of doesn't change, you know, that, or the language sort of subtly changes, and uh, 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 and that I think was where I found, you know, the ultimate, let's say, um, authenticity in, in the story, which is the the, the idea that uh, uh, that I could find a register that would carry through these two different worlds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a for me, it's a very interesting narrative project of yours, and you know. I, I almost want a guide you know, to to help me through because the, the language is dazzling, uh, and it's it's very con a very controlled kind of of dazzle because there, there always is a movement you know towards some sort of human core in in, in, in the stories and you know I'm I'm a generation ahead of you now and. You began talking about a story of mine called The North of God, and that's, that's a story that involves characters on a boxcar. Yeah, don't give it away, though. Well, on the way to the, to, to the death camp, and, and a character who is trying to beguile a mother and child uh, who are suffering uh, intensely by telling stories. And, so you know, it's a very literal, almost boneheaded notion that you know that, that a narrative can redeem you know experience, uh, a dark or tragic experience. Well, the truth is, it can't. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I I feel like when I read your stuff, there there is a, a, a kind of fearlessness, you know, where you you'll take a story to take your characters into places where they become separated from identity and the narrative itself, you know, is, is maybe imitating, you know, their experience of, of disconnection and, uh, and things get wild and confusing and, and sometimes even bewildering, you know, and, and then the, you know, the clarity Does it? Um, recurs. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, and so I, you know, again, this is a totally sort of nebulous question. But, yeah. But I guess I'm just asking what your what your thoughts are about narrative itself. I mean, for me, it's 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 more simple and a narrative freak. You know, I love a thumping good yarn. <laughs> I I don't I I I I, I don't necessarily have any overarching thought about narrative except to say that I never really think about it as, as I don't think about any part of the Pacific Ocean as separate. You know, I mean I think that 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 narrative is not in any way to me separate from language and vice versa. It's you know it's the glove and the widening of the glove is the same it's the same thing. But um, but I, 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 I think that uh, that when you're writing about the internet or writing about like as it in the story of it now about you know something that's reconstructed, something that is a remade flat iron building, I definitely have uh, a thought that, um, you know, just like I feel that I was born into, we're born actually a little late for, you know, a literature of exhaustion where these forms have, you know, been, been, been filled and used and refilled until there are leaks at the bottom. I feel like uh, uh, part of my project, at least with this book, was to sort of incorporate that exhaustion where the forms recur uh, until the point at which they become cliche to the point at which they become um, 
you know, unbottomed, let's say, and boring, and uh, and then they are abandoned. But at the same time, they're they're constantly shuffled in the same way that you know um, uh, life is repetitive, but certainly you know uh, online life is repetitive. And uh, uh, that that promise of total access to everything, but the uh, but the actual the real uh, experience of a narrow uh, stream of what you actually go after occasionally flecked with, you know, this is interesting here and this is interesting here. Um, and so I, 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 this was actually, there's no good answer for this, no positive answer, and certainly no way forward. But it, it, is, it, 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 it was the idea of incorporating these very, very exhausted forms, which are, you know, in this book, the folk tale, uh, the socialist realism in, in, in a few places. Um, Certainly, the the sort of minimalist writing and, and, and repetitions. It's a showcase of style. Well, but but what, but everything had to feel to me dead. Everything had to feel to me dead. Not in a in, in, a, in a totally negative way, like the, these things can never be used. But they had to feel to me that I could use them dispassionately because I don't necessarily have um, the ability, nor I think I don't think this is maybe the time to. Uh, to be able to change. The forms might be in it. I think that that's arguable, but the language is so alive, you know. And even we talk about Beckett in the same vein, you know, mm -hmm. we'll write about a character who has, you know, no particular, you know, no history, no culture, mm -hmm. no name even. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, they, they conceive in the language that is that is Sure, and but also you walk, but also you walk the tightrope. I mean, there are very few instances of Beckett of any sort of formal uh, change, you know. So you know, and, and 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 for me, the statuism of Beckett, you know, the stasis of all of these things uh, is elemental and enormously interesting, but not in any way. Um, that's not what I go to Beckett for, you know. And and so uh, uh, I feel like maybe the one thing I didn't do in this book because. A decision you have to make. I mean, there's kind of one way to write a more development composition, and there's one way to write a, a Beckett book, and that's you know, you set up the monolith. And uh, but but this had to be a, a, something that had to deal with rate of change, had to deal with speed, had to deal with efficiency, and it had to deal with um, the bewildering efficiency, that desire for speed because you're impatient, but yet when the speed comes to you, you're confused. Yeah, velocity is a word that kept coming to mind as I 